All right. Hello, good evening, and welcome. I don't think anyone's old enough to remember uh, that used to be on the telly. Right, so tonight we're going to be looking at C2. Sorry about the uh, light being in my face. I've just woke up. <laughs> um, right, okay, so we're going to look at C2 tonight. Um, and we've got a, a PowerPoint that's a little bit different. Um, so uh, we'll share that with you so you can see what we're doing. I'll just put that down there, C2. Okay, so right, so C2 then um, looks at the structure of the earth um, and then it looks at all the materials that we can get from the earth that we use every day Ooh, excuse me, for all the different products that we use. Um, materials that we use to make uh, cars. We also look at the manufacture of ammonia in the harbour process. We'll have a look at acids, bases and neutralisation reactions. Um, and then we'll have a little look at electrolysis. Oh, it's come up straight away. Okay, so this first part then, for anybody that does geography, um, this should be fairly straightforward. Um, and it's all to do with the structure of the earth, because this topic... Um, is looking at resources that we take from the earth. So you may remember back in year eight when you did the rock cycle, for instance. So um, if you remember that we said that all rocks sort of um, go from one type to another. So we start off with igneous rocks that come out of volcanoes. And we say that if they cool down really slowly, it gives the crystals a chance to form, and so they have large crystals. Oh, Whereas if they've got small crystals in, it just means it's cooled down really quickly. Okay, and then we said that from igneous rocks, which are really hard rocks uh, with interlocking particles, we get metamorphic rocks. Um, so an igneous rock might be something like granite or basalt. Uh, metamorphic rock might be something like marble or slate and they're usually really tough as well um, and usually formed under heat and pressure and then lastly when all the bits are broken off and then they're all squashed together we get sedimentary rocks. Now all of that um, is basically sitting on the outside of the earth uh, apart from the bit uh, to do with volcanoes where the molten rock um, finds its way to the Earth's surface, <laughs> um, and um, comes out there. Might be a, a key word here you might not have heard of: lithosphere. This is the crust and the outer part of the mantle, uh, because on the Earth you've got the crust, the mantle, the outer core, and the inner core. Okay, and we say that the crust um, is at the top. Uh, just on the outside, it's two parts, usually oceanic and continental. Then you've got your mantle, which extends almost halfway to the centre of the Earth, and that's that like, dark orangey part there. Um, and then you've got your core, which accounts for over half the Earth's radius, and it's made mostly of iron, which is why we end up with um, our magnetic fields, uh, because of the iron core. Now, the thing is, um, it's really hard to work out the structure of the Earth inside because, um, apart from the fact that it's so hot and it's so molten, so um, if you remember back to the topic P1, um, you look at P, wave, P waves and S waves and we look at how they travel um, across the Earth and whether they can be detected. Um, and we'll be having a look at that in more detail next week. But that's what we do to have a look at the structure of the Earth. Now, originally, um, there's this chap here called uh, Begner. He came up with the theory of plate tectonics and said that if you actually squashed all of the continents back together, they actually are a big jigsaw puzzle. And really, I always find this dead fascinating because if you look at a globe, that's exactly what it looks like. I'm just wrestling the cat here a minute. She's trying to get on my lap. Um, and then the last thing to do with the uh, structure is this thing over here called subduction. 
you might be asked um, to uh, talk about subduction and what it is. That's just when two plates come together. And it's usually an oceanic plate collides into a continental plate. And the oceanic plate dips underneath the continental plate and then melts. So if you have an exam question, it's usually two marks to say that the oceanic plate dips underneath the um, uh, continental plate and it uh, melts. Is it going to work? Not looking like it. Uh, I'll just go down to the next one. Okay, so construction materials in. So, we've just talked about the structure of the earth. Now let's have a look at some of the materials that we can take from the earth. So, first of all, um, you've got things like limestone and marble, which are both forms of calcium carbonate. Um, so, these are used a lot in construction. Um, marble is far more expensive and used much less, but it is much uh, stronger. It doesn't erode as much. Oh. Right, these are both made of calcium carbonate. Now, this is quite a nice little experiment you can do. You can take a little bit of calcium carbonate, you can put it into a uh, boiling tube, um, and if you heat up just the calcium carbonate, um, you could actually make the two products that come out of it. You can make calcium oxide and carbon dioxide. Um, and you might be asked in one of your exam questions how you can test for carbon dioxide. It's lime water. You bubble the lime water. You bubble the calcium. Oh, let's try again. You bubble the carbon dioxide through the lime water, and it makes it go cloudy. Okay, so that's two of the chemicals there. Uh, yeah. Um, two other chemicals, uh, materials here, you've got iron and aluminium. Now, you can't just go um, to uh, one particular place on the earth and say, oh, look, there's a lump of iron, oh, look, there's a lump of material, uh, aluminium. Usually, it's little bits of metals that are stuck in rocks. And what we have to do is we have to take the um, rocks and break them down and take the uh, particles out and put them all together to make a big lump of iron or aluminium. So they're usually called ores. Rocks are called ores that have got bits of aluminium or iron in. Clay is a rock that makes bricks uh, and then glass is made from sand and it's superheated uh, sand to make um, glass. I always find that bit fascinating that you can uh, take this sand uh, that's like you can't see through, heat it up and then you can see through it, it's very weird. Um, right, aggregate, that's another word you might come across. Aggregates are crushed up rocks. Usually whenever you're making a new road um, or um, once I actually laid um, a driveway, you have to put a, a layer of aggregate underneath crushed up rocks to take all the pressure and the pounding of the cars above. Um, so you should always have a layer of aggregate to help to support all the extra weight. So we've talked a lot there about rocks. So let's have a look at how we actually get them. Well, there's two ways you can do it. You can either carry out mining, which is going underground and digging rocks out, or quarrying, which is where you've got big cliffs of rocks and you put explosives into them, blow them up and then take the rocks out of the quarry. Now you might be asked um, advantages and disadvantages of these. Well, first of all, uh, they bring in money, jobs. Um, the quarrying in particular, because you've dug out all the landscape, because you've blown all the rocks up, usually means you've got a bit of a hole in the ground. So what they can do is they can fill that up with water and it makes a nice new water park. However, the opposite to that is because you're digging up lots of rocks, it can be very noisy, it can be dusty, takes up land, it changes the shape of the landscape, landscape but also increases local road traffic. 
So I've seen uh, questions that come up on this before, where it's to do with the uh, the moral um, side of it. Um, so it's the advantages and disadvantages. Um, and then lastly, it's this little bit here to do with cement. Cement is made by heating clay and limestone together. The thing is, cement on its own, um, if any of you have ever bought a bag of cement, it's that really fine grey powdery stuff. Um, and you can put your hands into it, it's all very lovely and soft. Although technically you shouldn't because it's got uh, lime in it and it can actually um, hurt your hands a little bit. But it is nice. Um, however, if I want to make concrete, which is much stronger than just cement alone, I mix cement and sand and aggregate and water. And usually it's the ones that you see in the cement mixers. And by doing that, I'll make this really thick substance. Now the thing is, I could quite easily make a big concrete block, uh, but it won't be very strong. So what I need to do is I need to reinforce it. So if I put steel rods into it, um, then I can have reinforced concrete, and that's much stronger. It's much less brittle. Because the trouble is, if I made a big wall of concrete, you literally only have to give it a good bang and the whole thing will crack and fall apart. However, if I've got steel rods running through it, it reinforces it, makes it really strong. Now, you might have actually seen uh, this taking place. There's a lot of building work going on in Birmingham city centre at the moment. And sometimes when you're going along, you might see a building where it looks like it's half built and then it's got like rods coming out the top of it. And that's because what they do is they put all the steel rods in place and then they make a frame and then they pour the concrete into the frame um, so that uh, they let it dry, take the frame away and then you've got a reinforced concrete building, very strong uh, and safe to use because it can withstand um, lots of shakes from earthquakes and bad weather. This isn't passing on to the next one so I'm going to have to do it this way. Okay, so we've talked then about um, some of the rocks and we've talked about the materials they give us. Now we need to have a look at some of the metals and how we can actually get uh, metals uh, for some of the things that we need. It's interesting because copper um, is an amazing uh, metal, it's a really good conductor of um, heat and electricity. And um, as soon as mobile phones uh, started to become popular, the need for copper has actually shot up um, because you have like copper um, particles within the uh, phones. The trouble is, we've only got a certain amount of copper on the earth, and once it's gone, it's gone. So there is a lot of recycling at the moment to get some of it back, which is why. You see all these scrap men collecting metal because if they take that to the uh, scrap yard they can get a lot of money uh, for recycling. Now the thing is, with copper we want to be able to get pure copper. So we have to use this process called electrolysis. Now this is one that people really struggle with um, uh, to understand what's going on. Um, so. If we took um, a solution with copper in it called copper sulfate, we call that the electrolyte, it's just the solution, it's just the blue material, and we put two um, electrodes into it, and usually they're made of copper as well. Um, what can happen is if we looked at the anode, the anode will take the pure copper and it will strip two electrons away from it so that it can be released from the other chemicals and then in the solution that copper that's had its two electrons stripped from it will go over to the cathode and the cathode will put two electrons back onto it to make it um, a full copper uh, particle again but this time it's not attached to anything so it's just a pure copper particle so if you looked at the anode the anode would actually be um, dissolved and the cathode would actually get quite fat because it would be collecting the copper. Now I know that this is a really difficult one to remember so I made up a little story. So Annie is a very naughty girl 
and she strips the dirty copper of two of his electrons. And now the copper who hasn't got two electrons is bare and he's scared and he runs over to see Kathy and Kathy says, oh, don't worry, and gives him two electrons back. And so now he becomes a complete copper again and he's happy again. I know it's a stupid story, but if it helps you to remember, that's the idea. Uh, because like I say, this isn't always an easy thing. Can I just say though, if you look here, this here where it says minus and this here where it says plus, you've got two processes called oxidation and reduction. If you remember, oxidation is loss, oil rig, oxidation is loss. So that means this copper here has lost two electrons, so this is oxidation. This has got a plus here, so this is reduction is gain. I know it sounds weird, because it's like, well, why would be reducing be gain? But it just is. Reduction is gain. Oxidation is loss. Reduction is gain. Okay, so let's have a look at some other metals then. You can see there's quite a lot of that slide is to do with copper. But there are other metals as well. So first of all, you've got this process of rusting. Um, so rusting is when you take iron, but you have to have the other conditions as well. You have to have water and oxygen. So this is an oxidation reaction where they join together to make hydrated iron 3 oxide. Now sometimes if you're driving along and you look at like a, a cliff face and you see that it's quite orange, that will be because it's got lots of little iron particles in it and they have reacted with the water and the oxygen uh, to carry out this rusting process. The thing is though, um, if you take away one of those conditions, so if you take away the oxygen or you take away the water, then the rusting process will not take place, it will be much slower. So that's uh, rusting with iron. The last part is to do with alloys. Now an alloy is a mixture of a metal with another element and this is really good because when you mix elements together because of their properties you get a different element uh, with those properties so it works quite nice. So amalgam uh, used to be an alloy with mercury that used to be used for fillings in teeth um, but when they realised that mercury actually is quite toxic they don't use that uh, anymore um, and in fact anyone that's buried if they've got mercury in the teeth they usually uh, take the fillings out. Brass contains copper and zinc and is used in coins and trumpets. Solder contains lead and tin and is used in joining electrical wires and then this last one is a new one and especially if you do DT you might have heard of this you got something called nitinol. Nitinol is a smart alloy. There's a lot of these smart materials coming about which can make objects that return to the original shape. So if you've seen any of these um, adverts where you know people have got these glasses and uh, the actual frames of them, so and then they sit on them and they're like, oh no, I've broke my glasses. Well actually they don't because they're made from smart alloys that return to their original shape. So the way it works is not to know, if you um, bend it up into some kind of different shape, as soon as you put it into any heat, it will make it go back to its original shape because it will use the energy to help it to go back to its original shape. It's going to work. Right, this next one, building cars. This one students tend to be quite good at. Um, usually you're given some kind of data of table um, about iron uh, which is used to make steel or aluminium uh, in a car. And they might say to you, why would you pick this particular material? So what you've got to do is look for the properties of what makes it good for that particular job. So for instance, if you're making the body of a car you might prefer to use steel because steel, apart from the fact it's a lot cheaper, is actually it still can be um, moulded into shape, but it's actually a, a very strong material. However, steel rusts. But you so the other side of it is you might say, well, actually, I prefer to use aluminium because aluminium is less dense 
Well, if it's less dense, it means it's going to be lighter, so it's going to be better on fuel economy. Um, it doesn't rust or corrode. Um, it still can be bent into shape. However, um, it um, can be bent much easier. So if there's a car crash, it can be bent. But then, if you've got uh, bars in the doors and things like that to stop crashes, that might actually come back. So look at the table of data it wants, it gives you, and look at what you actually need to work out for the question. Oh boy, this doesn't move on. From that, come out again. Okay, so. Right, so we've looked at rocks that we take from the earth, we looked at metals we take from the earth. The next thing we're going to look at is making ammonia. Now this is a process that was actually invented by a person called Fritz Haber. Now the thing is, this chap, he was given the job of uh, making explosives. Um, so that was his job originally, uh, they wanted to make explosives. But what he actually did was he came up with this absolutely brilliant process. And what he did um, is he took um, nitrogen and he took hydrogen and he managed to join those two chemicals together to make ammonia. Now, the great thing is about that is the ammonia can actually be used to make fertilizers that are actually put onto um, farm crops to make them grow. So that was absolutely brilliant. However, they can also be used to uh, make bombs as well. He actually won a Nobel Prize for uh, inventing this process. And the reason it was so good is because of this arrow here. First of all, hopefully you'll realise this arrow means that it's a reversible reaction. So you can take the nitrogen and hydrogen and make ammonia, or you can reverse it to get the nitrogen and hydrogen back. The other brilliant thing about it was when he put these two chemicals into his machine, his um, big processor, yes he did need uh, some um, conditions. He needed, and these, you must remember these, he needed an iron catalyst. He worked out that you needed 200 atmospheres of pressure and he worked out that you needed a temperature of 450 degrees. So if you had those conditions right and you put those two chemicals together, the nitrogen and hydrogen would squash together to make ammonia. But if there was any nitrogen and hydrogen left over, then they would go into the machine and they'd go all the way back to the beginning and back in again. So the reason it's so great is there's lots of recycling and no waste. So that's why, again, it was another uh, brilliant machine. However, um, there are some cost issues uh, to make the new substance. The price of the energy. Now this is looking at the temperature, 450 degrees. Now if you looked at this graph here, you might say, well hang on a minute then, you, can make, you could make more. Look at that graph, uh, the axis, you can't see the axis on that. Um, if you um, heated it up more, you could make more. Well, actually, um, yes, you could. But the trouble is it costs so much money to get the heat up to that higher temperature, it didn't make the whole process worthwhile. Um, so that's why they decided on 450 degrees. The same process thing with the atmospheres. If you had more pressure, then you could have a higher yield but again, it was very expensive to maintain the pressure. And so um, it meant that, yes, you could make more, but it just cost too much in the long run. So the harbour process conditions that have been settled on and have been used for many years is an iron catalyst, 200 atmospheres of pressure, and 450 degrees. However, um, another thing that actually helps to reduce the costs, obviously catalysts, um, help to um, increase the rate of a reaction. The number of people required to operate the machinery, this literally just did most of it itself. It was an automated system, so you don't have to pay people to do it. You just literally put the chemicals in one side, they squash together, 
to make ammonia and it just got collected out the other side. And also, like I said, the recycling of the reactants meant that you could reduce your costs. Oh, come on. <laughs> oh, we've moved. Okay, now that last slide where I talked about the harbour process, um, where we talked about the nitrogens and hydrogens joining together to make ammonia. Now, yes, that is the harbour process, but they might give you some kind of exam question that does exactly the same thing, it's got exactly the same issues with temperature and pressure. Uh, but we might use different chemicals, so don't let it throw you. Um, it's the same principle behind it. Right, this next part of the topic then is looking at word equations and balancing equations. And this is where you need to learn some rules. First of all, if you look up here, um, these are some basic equations uh, to do with uh, neutralizations and and uh, putting acids and uh, alkalis together to make salt and water and so on. So first of all, a neutralization. If you remember the pH scale, down at the bottom, if you've got something that's acid, that's down at this end over here, and it's red. If you've got something that's alkali, the pH is about 14, 13, 14, and it's like a blue or a purple color. If I want to make a neutral, I would add something at this end to something at this end to make a green in the middle. So for instance, if I move two steps away uh, from the neutral and I add an acid that was a pH of about 5, I would have to add an alkali that's about two steps away from the neutral in the opposite direction and I'd have to add an alkali that was about a 9. If I put those two together, I would get to the middle to make a seven. It's a bit like a big seesaw, if you like. You go two steps away there, you've got to go two steps away there, and then that'll make a neutral. So if I go all the way down to here, if I took an acid from this end that's very strong, I would have to have an alkali from this end that's very strong to balance it to become a neutral. And we use universal indicator to give you those colours. So Acids and bases are chemical opposites, and when they are added together, they cancel each other out. Now, you might say to me, oh, hang on a minute, what's going on? Um, so, what's a, a base then? Um, so, bases are substances that are oxides or hydroxides of metals and have pH greater than 7. Soluble bases are called alkalis. So, really, bases are your sort of this end, it's the alkalis end. It's just the ones that are solid are bases, and the ones that are soluble are alkalis. But generally, just sort of remember um, alkalis from this end. Um, if you add them together, they cancel each other out, and this is called a neutralization. So if I took any acid and mixed it with any base or alka alkali, I would make a salt and water. Now, this isn't just... This isn't the salt on your chips. In chemistry, we call it a salt and water. So what that means, if I had an acid and a base, I would get this water that I would evaporate out and I'd be left with some crystals. And those crystals would be the salt that are left behind. So let's have a look at how that works. There's some simple rules that you've got to remember. If I have hydrochloric acid, I will make a chloride salt. If I have a sulfuric acid, I'll make a sulfate salt. If I have nitric acid, I'll make a nitrate salt. Or if I have a phosphoric acid, I'll make a phosphate salt. So let's put that into action then. So if I had hydrochloric acid, add sodium hydroxide. What I'd do is I'd take the first part of the base, which is the sodium, and then I'd mix it with my acid and I'd make a chloride. So my salt, the name of my salt would be sodium chloride plus water. If I had nitric acid plus, um, I don't know, uh, calcium hydroxide, whatever, um, I would make calcium 
uh, sulfate plus water. Now these really, it's quite difficult to do on here without uh, a pen and paper. Um, so really your teacher should run through some of these with you. Once you start getting the hang of these, the same rules apply every time. Every time you make water, so remember that. Every time you make a salt. The only difference is, is this part, the base. Because if I've got sodium hydroxide, I'm going to make um, sodium and whatever acid it is. So let's just say if it's chloride. So sodium chloride. However, if I had a hydrochloric acid and sodium carbonate, the clue is in this bit, carbonate. Because this time I'd still make sodium chloride because of the acid. But I'd also make water, like I did before. However, because it's a carbonate, I would also make carbon dioxide. And carbon dioxide, again, can be tested with lime water, and it'll make it go milky or cloudy. Now, you might be asked to talk about, um, well, how does this actually work? Okay. Well, the idea is that acids contain substances uh, that contain hydrogen ions and have a pH less than 7. So um, if you look here then you have hydrogen ions and hydroxide um, ions and they join together to make water. Water is a neutral. So just think about that H2O. The H part comes from the acid. The OH part comes from the um, alkali. Put the two together and you make water H2O. So H, OH, put them together, you make H2O. So if they ask you about how it actually works, you just say about hydrogen ions and you say about um, hydroxide ions joining together to make water. And, oh, still, oh no, see now it's come too far now. Oh, there you go. Okay, now this is a very, there's two six mark questions on here. Um, now I've just talked to you about neutralization and making a neutral. And this here is and can potentially be a six mark question talking about how to make a neutral using a process called a titration. Now, a titration is just a very posh name for uh, mixing an acid and an alkali together, but you're using a burette, which is a long, thin measuring cylinder. So if I want to make a, um, a fertilizer using the process of a neutralization, all I would do is I'd take a burette and I would fill it up with acid. And then um, underneath that, I would, it's basically like a big measuring cylinder, Underneath that, I would put a little conical flask. In that conical flask, I would put a known amount. Uh, if I put acid, I think I said acid, acid in the burette, then I'd put a known amount of alkali in the conical flask. So let's just say I put 20 milliliters of um, alkali in the conical flask. So what I'd do then is I'd put a little bit of indicator in with the alkali. So that as I add the acid, I can work out when it's becoming a neutral. So from the burette, I turn the little tap and I will release the acid. And very slowly, I'll wait to see until it turns neutral. As soon as it turns neutral, I'll turn the tap off on the burette. And then I can have a look at how much acid I've used. Now the thing is, great, I've made a neutral. But the trouble is, um, it's contaminated with the universal indicator. So I've worked out how much acid I need, I've worked out, worked out how much alkali I need, I just need now to uh, do the whole thing again but without the indicator. And that's how you carry out a, a titration. Now the other side of this is because ammonia helps uh, with making fertilizer, as I said earlier, uh, to help plants to grow. Also you've got your chemicals, NPK, nitrogens, phosphorus, potassiums, and this comes up in P4 as well, where they talk about what these chemicals are for. Okay, so nitrogens help plants to grow because the nitrogens make amino acids, 
and amino acids make proteins, proteins help with growth and repair. Uh, phosphorus and potassium help with respiration, potassium helps with um, the fruit developing. So I put all of these crops onto, um, sorry, not crops, all this fertiliser onto my fields. So this is the other second six marker that could come up and does come up quite often. So the, fer the farmer sprays all these uh, chemicals, all this fertiliser onto his field. And the trouble is he does it on a rainy day or a windy day. And what happens is all of this fertiliser gets washed into the local river. Now this is a big problem because when you look at a river it's like, it looks like a little bit of a green colour. And the reason for that is because it's got these little tiny green plants in called algae. If you imagine if a fertiliser makes crops grow really quick, can you imagine what it does to algae? It makes that grow really quick. And so the fertiliser goes into the waterways, it makes the algae grow. Okay. Now this is a problem because it causes this whole um, blanket, we call it algal bloom. So because you're forming this like blanket over the top, all the plants uh, underneath can't get the sunlight, and so they can't carry out photosynthesis, so they die. Because they die, they can't make, or, um, can't make any um, oxygen. Any oxygen that was in there, the microbes use it up, um, and then that means uh, that they can't do anything. Now the fish have got nothing to eat because all the plants have died, they can't get any oxygen, so the fish die as well. Okay, so eutrophication is the fertilizers washing into the lakes. It causes algal bloom. The plants stop uh, for uh, carrying out photosynthesis, uh, so they don't produce any oxygen. The microbes use up all the oxygen. There's no oxygen left for the fish. The plants die. The fish die. It's all very sad and very bad. Another reason why with hydroponics we don't release the water into the waterways because it's full of fertilizers. Ah, okay. Right, the last slide on here and I would say one that you really must learn because I, if I had to make a prediction I would say this is going to come up this year. Last year electrolysis of copper came up, this year I really think this one's going to come up um, and that's the electrolysis of sodium chloride. Now I actually think this is like quite an amazing little process. Because what you're doing is you're taking salty water, just salt and water that um, they call it brine, B R I N E, brine, um, salty water. You can make this at home, just get some water, put some salt in it, salty water. No, no problems with it. But the thing is, with salty water, is you can actually split those chemicals up. Um, and make some really quite dangerous chemicals. Now brine, if you think about it, you could go to the shop and buy a tin of tuna in brine tin of, uh, and all that is, is like I said, salty water. So think about the chemicals in there. You've got water, which is H2O, hydrogens and oxygens, and you've got salt, which is sodiums and chlorines uh, joined together to make sodium chloride. Okay, so um, you've got those four chemicals. We put those into this uh, process of electrolysis again, just like we did with the copper. And you've got your anode and you've got your cathode. And the same thing happens again. This time, though, on your anode, um, which is your positive electrode, the chlorine is formed because two electrons are stripped away from the chlorine particles to make um, a molecule of chlorine gas. That gas then floats up and is collected at the top. Okay, At the cathode, the cathode is a negative electrode and that um, adds on two electrons to the hydrogen to make a molecule of hydrogen gas. So that floats up and is collected at the top. And that means what's left in here are some oxygens, some hydrogens, and sodiums. So if I join all of those together, I make sodium hydroxide. 
Now you might say to yourself, okay, well that don't sound too bad. But actually, you've started off with salty water. With some people, you know, if you've, uh, I don't know, had an infection in your mouth or something, some people gargle salty water. There's nothing to it. Um, what you've actually done is you've took this harmless chemical and you have now given chlorine gas out of it, which can be highly dangerous. However, it is used to sterilise water, but only in small parts. It can be used to make solvents and some plastics as well. Uh, I just need to say here, the test for chlorine gas, if you put some blue litmus paper near it, it will actually bleach it white if there's chlorine there. So you've got chlorine used to sterilise water. You've got hydrogen, which if you're asked how to test for hydrogen, it's the squeaky pop test. You put a splint into it and it will uh, make a squeaky pop. Um, and that's because it's highly explosive. Now hydrogen is actually forced through your um, saturated fats to help them to spread more to make it into margarine. So if you have a look on your margarine tub, it will say hydrogenated fat. And all it means is it's had this hydrogen forced through it. Um, and then in here, you're left with your sodium uh, hydroxide. The sodium hydroxide is actually used to make soap. However, if you mix the sodium hydroxide with chlorine, you can actually make bleach, which again can be uh, really bad on your skin. It can be really, uh, well, you can take your skin apart. And that's why I find this chemical reaction um, quite fascinating. Because you just start up with this harmless salty water, you break the components down and you end up with chemicals that are potentially quite dangerous. Now remember again, oxidation and reduction, it's this here. This minus sign tells me I have lost some electrons, so it has got to be oxidation. Oxidation is lost, oil rig. Reduction is gain. This one has gained some electrons. Okay. The last part to this is sometimes they might say to you, well, um, what about uh, salt mining? So what you're going to think about is when land was covered in sea at one stage, all the salty water um, was on the land. When the coastline, um, when the sea receded and pulled back, some of the water got trapped underground with all the salty parts. As the water evaporated, it meant we were left with lots of salt. So some people say, well, how do we get that out? And what you can do is you can flush it out with water, dissolve all the salt, take the water out, and then evaporate the water out, and you'll just get the salt deposits left. Or you can take some of the solid rock and use it for gritting the roads, which is what they do over the winter. So overall, that's C2. Um, the chemical reactions, I really think you need to... Um, practice some of those and once you get the hang of it if you want to come and see me I'll go through some of them with you um, let's just stop that let's check if you're still with me there you go uh, yeah, your chemical reactions if you want to go through some of them come and see me uh, and I'll show you how to do it because it, it literally is one of those penny drop moments once you get it you get it okay so thank you very much um, P1 and P2 next week uh, if you've got any uh, anything to tell me to do to improve please tell me Okay, thank you very much.